Thank you, Anne-Marie, for doing this with me. I can't wait to <laughs> dive more on what we are going to talk about, even if I don't know what exactly, like I know, but I don't know where we are going <laughs> because I think it will be an amazing conversation. Absolutely. I'm so excited to talk to you and we'll see what comes out because, yeah, I mean, traditionally it's like midwives and anaesthetists don't necessarily work on the same plane. <laughs> yeah, we kind of butt heads. We want physiological birth and they want to be neutral. <laughs> but we are, we are fighting the same fight. We are on the yeah. same team, so I'm loving it. Yeah. It's awesome. Do you want to introduce yourself, and marie Because I usually let others introducing. I feel more authentic. Um, so any anything you want to share uh, about yeah, you? Yeah, cool, cool. So um, I'm Anne-Marie. My, I guess my brand, my mission now is under the whole doctor. I trained as a conventional medicine doctor and worked in that system for about 14 years. And I specialized as an anesthesiologist, or as we say in Australia, an anesthetist. And so I was in that world. And just to keep it in the vein of what we're talking about here, I actually really, really didn't enjoy obstetric work at all. There was something in me that it just repelled me. I found it just completely not my world. And it's interesting because I even did some time in Africa for six weeks because I felt my obstetric education in medical school was really lacking. Even to get a delivery, a normal, de a normal delivery, and it was in hospital, of course, was very, very challenging. So I went to Kenya and I spent six weeks there. And that was where I sort of got my first impression of what obstetrics really is and what birthing really is but again it was only through the hospital lens and through my journey I've discovered that the medical system does not have all the answers and so I basically went on my own journey of discovery and healing and got into yoga and meditation I became an integrative health practitioner I work predominantly with women on hormonal issues burnout detoxing all the things I had a yoga studio and then finally um, I decided to just pull the pin from medicine and I left my anesthetic career entirely. I stepped out. I couldn't stay in both worlds anymore. It was just such a disconnect and thought I need to step into my truth and my authentic work properly. But I still have all that incredible medical background in physiology, anatomy, pharmacology. It's all so relevant. So now I'm trying to use that wisdom and knowledge to support women and looking for more natural alternatives and going back to how we used to do things when our bodies were more balanced, when we had less stress. And so that's the, that's the mission of my work now is to sort of re-empower, re-educate and guide women, one woman at a time, back to her own authentic journey, her own intuition and trusting her body again and all the gifts that this incredible feminine vessel gives us. Yeah. So that's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I relate with, with what you're saying because I have a similar but different um journey <clears throat> where I could I couldn't stand anymore to be in a hospital and see all that birth that you know as a midwife you study about physiology of birth and then you work in a hospital and maybe you see once in a while that physiology exists and i was asking myself why why is it that so i want to ask you um what do you think like what does work and what doesn't work in the medical system what do you what did you realize in these years where you that you were in the medical system in the hospital working um why things are not working or what is that is not working what is that is working let's start from there okay i think the greatest thing that i came to realize was the conventional or modern medical system is really based around control First of all, it's about control. It comes directly from a, a belief of fear, of unsafety, that we can't trust our body and that we need to control it at every single possible junction. And that's a very masculine principle as well, is wanting to have this control. And 
Part of that is that that's also incredibly disempowering. So people stop trusting themselves. They stop trusting their own guidance and they basically outsource everything to a drug, to a doctor, to someone else. And even when those things, they get a sensation, people still get a feeling sometimes that, oh, this is, I'm not sure about this, this is not right, or they learn about all the side effects of something, but they still trust that system more than themselves. And I think this is, this is a huge problem for us as humans because we've completely disregarded our own sovereignty in our body, our own capacity for wisdom and knowledge that our body already gives us. And that's the problem that I saw in the system. People became overly reliant. We were the gods. We were put on pedestals. And I might spend 10 minutes with you. You've been in your body your whole life. What can I tell you? So when it comes to surgery, acute care, trauma, there is absolutely a role for modern medicine as it's practice. But the problem is it's getting its little tendrils into areas of health and wellness that it just doesn't have a belonging in. But I feel sorry for the system because also people are expecting that from the system. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of burnt out doctors, nurses, midwives, because they are no longer equipped to provide that empowerment to patients. They are just trying to do the work follow the protocols, follow the rules and not get burnt out and disengage themselves. Yeah. And I feel like when I was working the last probably six months, I was working in the hospital as consultant midwife. I was feeling like that I was just um, in automatic mode. I was, I wasn't able to be present with the patients, with the women, with the families and with, not even to, with myself because I was so sucked in the system, sucked in the routine that I was going kind of trauma response. No, I yeah. was just uh, uh, avoiding uh, nullify my who I was to respond to you know to many to what was happening and to many people around to the routine of the hospital. And so I feel sorry because many, many doctors, midwives, nurses are in this way. And uh, and I, I think the, 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 there are consequences for our own health to be in Absolutely. this way. Absolutely. Because the other issue is when we're working from that place, the clients and patients, they become a number. They become, oh, the gallbladder in room four Oh, you know, the woman that's failed, failed to progress. What an awful word, you know, in cubicle three. Like we just box them because it's easier. It's how our brains can cope. And then we lose all the creativity and individuality in healthcare. And I think that that's a huge disservice because there's so much individual variation and each person needs to be approached with their evolving journey through their, through their experience. And that is we no longer have the energy to do that because we're in overwhelm in the system. And then we're having negative consequences for staff and for patients. Yeah. So it's not a good mix. And yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely agree. I, t I could see it on myself too. I think you could see it on yourself too. And totally. how do you, you know, I know for myself because I, I experienced that, but how do you think in general or maybe even from your experience, <clears throat> how do you take the leap of, okay, I have enough, <laughs> I'm going to quit <laughs> and I'm going to do something else. Uh, where are the steps if there are any or what would yeah. you, a person might do if she I think, realize that? Yeah, I think it really depends how far you're in the system. And I think for, you know, for nurses and midwives as well, but even more so for doctors, because it's such a long journey and we get programmed from the beginning to put our own needs aside. We don't eat well. We, you know, show up super caffeinated. We stay over time. We do shift work. We put our whole lives aside because we think that that's actually the right thing to do. And we deeply want to help people. So I think for me, I had to start really sidestepping gradually because also 
I had built this idea of creating security for myself in my career. Like, oh, I will always be employed as a doctor. I will always have work. I'm doing good for society. You know, there was this belief system around it. And when I started seeing that I didn't fit in that model, it was like, well, I can either keep damaging myself and trying to stay here and having arguments with people at work, being in my director's office every week because I'd flown off and said something, you know, that was probably true but wasn't received in the best way because I was cycling through burnout. So I sidestepped personally first. I saw that I needed healing. I needed to re redefine who I was and meet myself again because I'd become Anne-Marie the medical student, Anne-Marie the intern, Anne-Marie the resident, Anne-Marie the anaesthetist, you know, and I was like, who's Anne-Marie anymore? And so I went through yoga. I I did all of this extra learning for me, but then I realized I had to share it with other people. So when I was in clinic, I started telling people about CBD oil and mm. supplements. And yeah. I started telling people to leave their GPs because their GPs were not serving them very well. And when I saw myself doing this more and more, I'm like, I can't stay here and keep doing this. I need to step out and do this. And for me, the final the final thing, I guess, was gratefully COVID and the pandemic because finally I could no longer deny that I was in a system that was just not for me. The approach, the mentality, the overwhelming stress response um, by doctors who were, this was our moment. I was like, okay, this is my last bastion of hope in this profession because this is our big moment. And we were floundering. We were absolutely floundering. And that's when I really started to think, okay, this is not my place. I need to go and step out and go into the big wide world and see what is out there for me and trust my wisdom, trust myself and back myself. And for me, I did have to, I, I had to leave Australia. That was a huge support for me because it was really putting a line saying, okay, this is your new life and this is your old life. And it made it easier. I think it would have been more challenging had I stayed in Australia and kept my studio going. It would have been more difficult. So all the pieces came together perfectly for me, but I think it's such an individual journey. But I encourage anyone out there that's feeling these little whispers, these little gut instincts, recognizing the damage they're doing to themselves in the system, not aligning with the style of work they're being forced to do in those systems and starting to ask questions and starting to look for alternatives to themselves because they, they're out there. And I think the more of us that step out of that model and start showing a different way, the healthier people are going to start to become, the more empowered people will start to become because the system's broken. Yeah. I agree. And when you were talking about, you know, telling your clients, leave your GP, do that. <laughs> I was thinking about me. I was doing similar things. You know, uh, women were not supported like they wanted to have a be back at home or mm. Mm, uh, give birth at home in under certain condition. And I was always telling them, you can do it. Come on. If you trust your, your body, you can do it. But just quit the hospital. Don't go there. Don't do that. Um, because ultimately, it's about trusting and taking responsibility back for ourselves, feeling the intuition. Because I think we are not used to, maybe women more, but in general, we are not used to actually, that is my intuition. That was it as well my what my gut feeling is telling me I follow that because how many times we follow the gut feeling and it's wrong probably never it's always kind of right yeah. and and we don't do it just few of us probably does that so yeah it's I think it's uh trusting is a big big thing um, yeah and I think the the trust and reconnection with our body needs to begin well before we're having a baby. And I think I saw that with a lot of women. Yeah. You know, they would go, oh, I'm pregnant. Now I'm going to start doing yoga. It's like, that's awesome. But why weren't you doing it before? Yeah. Like, let's get that connection back before we're in the most 
powerful yeah. experience you will ever have in the woman's body. You just think in nine months you're going to be ready for that when you've been ignoring your body for the last 20 years or more. Like yeah. that, that's the other piece. But even, even processing big stuff, like processing big trauma or starting a journey of, you know, awareness with your body. Yes, you can do it, I think, in pregnancy, of course. But I feel it can be very complex to do that um, because there are many things that are happening in yes. your body. Uh, yes. and in your mind in your, in your emotions so I'm yes. not sure like I know many women start doing that but it's not that easy um yeah exactly so it would be it would be the most challenging time but I think it also shows that women because we, we always look after everybody around us more than ourselves we are wired to do that and so it's like suddenly your body becomes really important because it's carrying another yeah. little body that's growing and it's like that's beautiful that's it's lovely that that awakening is happening at least through that birth process and carrying a baby yeah yes absolutely um i had a question um about okay if someone doesn't leave the the medical system how do you think we can support nurses, midwives, doctors who work in the medical system and are stressed or burned out? I mean, that's that's a big part of my work. But I think the first thing that has to happen is recognition of burnout, of the impacts of the work. And I think we got a little bit of a taste of that through the pandemic because the system was getting pushed so hard. And, you know, I think more and more, I heard about a lot more nurses leaving because during that time, the pressure that was already there just became at fever pitch. And the problem is, you know, I was working in a department, which was a really good department, actually. We had a sense around wellness, you know, but a lot of places will have these like, wellness coordinators or they'll do some token thing here or there but when a staff member steps out and says actually I'm in burnout I need leave I'm happy to take unpaid leave there is no system to support them and if anything particularly for doctors you're then viewed as well you can't handle weak. the job yeah yeah you are weak and you start to feel less as a healthcare worker that I'm not cut out for this. And actually the truth is the ones that are more likely to fall victim to burnout, fatigue, trauma are the ones we want in the system because they're the ones that feel everything, that are actually keeping their hearts open to the work and not becoming robotic. So we need to support those more sensitive people more than ever because they're the ones that we need. But the problem is the system won't recognise that burnout even exists the suicide rate in anaesthetists is still high. It's still growing. So this is the problem. The systems might be, they're like, yes, we acknowledge there's an issue. They do nothing to do anything about work hours, the shift work, the night shifts. We still had situations where nurses had nowhere to sleep during the night because you're not supposed to sleep. What a load of crap. We've got all the sleep research. You know, we are supposed to be sleeping at night. Let's support our healthcare workers in an evidence-based medicine way. And that's the thing. We say we practice evidence-based and we're not doing it with the staff. And so I that's kind of why I stepped out as well because I thought I can't help these people while I'm in this system because I can't give my full energy and capacity to this because I'm still in the system. But now I can bring everything I observed and experienced in those systems out to say, I'm here, I see you, I support you and come and let's go through this together. And I can show you the tools, the strategies that work for me, but there's not enough of me. You know, we need more of me and people like you that become mentors for people that may not be ready to leave the system or even better, we can support them to stay there because we still need these really good people in the hospitals to do that work because it's going to be there. So it's about trying to find that balance between both and just giving the support when it's when it's asked for yeah. and allowing people to ask for it. Yeah, in the UK, I don't know how many thousand of midwives left the system, I think, during the pandemic. 
<clears throat> because of the pressure. And that for me is a sign and it's not recognized. Uh, and I'm asking myself, what are they doing to change things? You know, you, mm. it's evident that they are quitting because they can't they can't deal with the pressure and they are all yeah. burnt out and stressed. I was also mentoring a midwife that she was telling me, you know, I spend my day when I'm off work sleeping and I have no energy at all for my life. And I'm like, why, why do we need to live in this way? It's, it's, it's not worth it, you know? So it's I understand why it. people leave uh, the system. I did too, because I thought, you know, my life is worth it more than actually. I love women. I, I have passions for midwifery. I love what I do, but I can do it even in a different way. I can do yes. managing my time, having time for me, having free time for me, doing other things and work and yeah, and, and, and do the both both things you know living my life and my passion as a midwife but in a different way um totally. yeah totally. I think it's uh it's so it was so clear for me uh yeah. but but it, it was also it was also challenging to support people who feel stuck in there and they can't yeah. leave because they have the mortgage they have expenses to pay, bills to pay, and they don't want to take the leap and trust and uh, do something else for themselves. So yeah. sometimes it's also hard to see that. And Definitely. But sometimes they're not ready at that moment, but you keep walking beside them. And I had a client who I started working with, I think it was three years or more ago now, and she was in nursing and then I just heard recently that she's finally at least left where she was working because she was doing shift work, it wasn't serving her. So she's still a nurse, it's brilliant, but she's changed how she yeah. works. But that took years and that's okay. That's okay as long as we start realigning with how we're living because how we show up at work is how we show up in life. And if you are spending your days off recovering from your work, that's an alarm bell. It's an absolute alarm bell. That can happen here and there. It's okay to have intense periods, but long-term, that's not sustainable. And we shouldn't want that for ourselves no. or our kids. So why perpetuate a model that is necessitating that? It's, it's not good. It's not what we're here for. It's not yeah, what we're definitely. here for. Um. Maybe another question about something different or related. Um, how do you think we can take responsibility for our health? So <laughs> not only in the like not only in the birthing, in the childbirth, but in for our health in general. What what it means for you to take responsibility and not having someone else to tell me you have this, this, this. You need to take this drug, um, but actually. Exactly feeling you know our body and, and and understanding our body have been connected with our inner knowing how do you think we can you know do that that's a great question because the answer is kind of in the question we need to take responsibility and I was saying this the other day because everyone is looking for the solution you know the six steps the 10 steps like tell me what to do it's like no because at some point I'm not going to be there. And so you have to own all of this yourself at some level. And so taking responsibility is treating your vessel as gold and understanding that it's not stagnant. There is nothing at all in life, in biology, that is stagnant. So nor is, is this. So what we have to do is constantly reconnect with our body in every moment, what am I feeling today, particularly for women and looking at our cyclical nature, it's easier for us in a way. We have this beautiful innate cycle in us. So that is teaching us that nothing is stagnant. What is working for you now will not work for you in the same way in maybe six months, six years. So it's constantly evolving your responsibility and how you respond to your body. And so that's what I say to people. It's not, it's not a destination. It's a journey. I am still changing how I am responsible with my own health and wellness because 
when I was working in the system before, I had to be I had to be strict with myself because if I want to stay in that system, there was no wiggle room in my health and wellness regime. I was detoxing every month. I was having high end supplements every single day. I was investing money to go to retreats to literally refuel and recharge myself. And when I came to Italy and I left that system and I didn't have my, you know, supplement powder and my smoothie every day. And I started reflecting and going, but wait a minute, I feel really good. My energy is really good. And I've had people say to me since I've left, Emery, you look amazing. Like you look so healthy and happy. And I'm like, yeah. And ironically, I haven't done a detox in two years. I am drinking more wine than I did before, but I'm in Italy. I've removed myself from a toxic environment into something that is aligning with me every day. And I can listen to my body, respect her rhythms, honor her rhythms and give her what she needs when she needs it and nothing more and nothing less. And I'm not perfect. And none of us should aim for perfection because this is nature and biology and she's also imperfect, particularly if we try to control. We have to have a degree of trust. And I think the main key to moving back to this is starting to listen to ourselves again. Do less, be more. We actually need to just be in our bodies more, tune into our bodies more, particularly as women. Because if you're stuck here in all the oh, I need to put these supplements in my smoothie and I need to, you know, book these appointments for the Cairo and my yoga class. And that's just outsourcing it all again. And you're avoiding your responsibility and your work and you yeah. showing up. And it's a daily practice. You have to keep showing up or over work, and over. Or work many hours and... Uh, go back home exhausted and you don't have time to and then you don't exactly and then that's I, it, for me it's easier to look after myself now and you know perhaps you might step out of work and you're going to earn less but I'm telling you what's the cost of your health uh, yeah. your longevity you know and you will find that you will have much more fulfillment maybe with less income when your body your health your wellness your energy is where it actually can be at its full potential rather than constantly being undermined in, you know, a toxic work environment with bad culture that is disempowering its staff and its patients. Yeah. And there are so many solutions to that. It's not that if you quit, you don't have like any opportunity. I feel that we are used to not to be in that role position and in that comfort zone so sometimes for people it's um you know it's easy to be oh this is what i'm meant to be oh, of course. what i'm meant to do of and, course. and i feel we, like yeah we've grown up being told what to do yeah our parents tell us what to do then the schools tell us what to do then the university tells us what to do of course we go into employment that does everything for us and tells us what to do. Show up at this time. This is when your break is. This is when you can have a holiday. No way. And also no. I feel the value of, for example, a salary is actually not exactly the value, what you, you are, what your value is, because who are they to tell me what is my value? And uh, even for midwife, I was always upset because I, I'm like, I know that I do more and I know that this is not, you know, my value. There is no value because I do it with all my heart. And for me, being there when actually, and yeah, as you said, I was told they were telling me what to do and blah, 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 my lifestyle, etc., my rhythm. And I was even valued less than I, I think I am. And, uh, and now that I'm, you know, self-employed, actually I decide, I choose the value that I put in my work, in myself. And it's so empowering. It's so empowering. Yes. yes. But the step that we all need to make is trust. And I think so many of us have forgotten how to trust ourselves. We, we, we just don't recognize that the most important thing is trust in ourselves. When you start to rebuild that relationship 
you start to be able to move out and go, wow, I really could just look after myself maybe and not have to be employed by someone, create my own hours, create my own work. And now more than ever, with the capacity of the internet, of Zoom, of social media, like it's a free for all. Honestly, yeah. you can you can get out there and you can take what you've already done it's not like you're throwing it in the garbage it is still of value because there's only one you and you can bring your full self out into the world in whatever way that really lights you up and that's what's going to light other people up and that's what our mission should be as humans lighting each other up yeah um since you are you know, in Italy, immerse in nature. I would love to ask you, what's what does nature do for you? Oh. Oh. You know, it's funny because I reflected now more and more back when I was a kid, like little moments. And some of my most profound memories of my childhood were all nature related. You know, I would be like playing out in the rain in Northern Queensland. I was always in water. I was riding my bike through rainforests. Like these are my big memories. And I went into a, a way of being where I was indoors most of the time. Mm -hmm. I was at a desk. I was in an operating theater, even worse, with no natural light. And I was craving that connection. So I might go to the beach and get a little bit of a hit. But until I moved to Italy and I could really be with this earth because there is something very special about this land there's special things in australia too but if you're in a city you can't sense it but italy there is an energy here and particularly in puglia with these thousands of year old olive trees that have just lived through so much i can get so much nourishment from being out in that environment having my feet on the earth being in the ocean here getting all those minerals because we are water too and more and more being able to see the moon because as women we are absolutely connected to the lunar cycle whether we recognize it or not when you start to recognize it and even just the practice of acknowledging the full moon and the new moon every month which is one of the things i do in my membership because i think it's so powerful if that's all you do as a woman that's a really good beginning because you're acknowledging nature and your connection to your feminine energy and cyclical living. And it also takes the pressure off because we are like the earth. We are like nature. We cycle as well. So we are aiming for this perfection destination and we're supposed to cycle. Mm -hmm. We are supposed to life, death, life cycle. We are supposed to go through our seasons. And I think that nature reminds us of that every single day. So I no longer seek perfection for myself. I am kinder to myself. I trust that if something is difficult, summer is going to come again, guaranteed. And that is my connection with nature, that she reminds me of that. And I feel that I'm so much more respectful of my body now that I can draw that connection with nature and my body together so much more. I'm realizing that we're one. And I think it's a huge lesson in our world right now that it's not an accident that our earth, our planet is in the situation she is in and the feminine is in the suppression that she is in. We are one and the same. And so if we start to heal women, to uplift women, to re-empower women, we are going to be able to start healing this planet as well because it's through women that we're going to be able to do that because we're connected. That's the feminine energy. That's the creative energy of nature and and the feminine i also say healing birth healing earth because uh when we I birth when we birth but not even you know babies projects wherever we are birthing actually we are connected to ourselves because we follow our intuitions our instincts our our bodies so and so if we do that then as you said we heal earth but yeah. if we are controlled and with, you know, this distortion of uh, the masculine energy and, you know, we have to control birth, we have to control women, um, yeah. then we are not, we are, we are going nowhere. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think one of the beautiful things that we see when we bring nature and birth together is birthing in water. 
And I watched this incredibly powerful documentary of women birthing in the Black Sea. And it just makes so much sense. And we know even through the anesthetic world that water is an amazing analgesic in labor. We will acknowledge that. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's seen as woo-woo. And it's like, it's not woo-woo. Like this is our natural connection to these elements. We should be using that and harnessing that rather than dismissing it. Yeah. And how beautiful that when we slow down, when we step back, and we slow down and we connect to nature and we take responsibility back and we take ownership and of our bodies and our decision that actually life takes a completely another direction um me it's i feel it's more has more meaning like yeah. uh it's worth yeah. to live um and you you are connected with the present moment rather than projecting in the future or so I feel it yeah it's so beautiful that when you slow down and step back actually wow life is amazing beautiful (laughs) that's right because honestly I really believe that life is just waiting for us oh yeah it's just waiting for us to just pause and go okay I'm here and then life goes, oh, great, nice to meet you. Let's actually get things started. You, you know, you're so busy in the doing and in these places and you're missing yeah. out, you're not connected. And life is very patient. Yeah. So it will be there when you're ready. But don't don't take too much time. Don't waste too much time because um, it's amazing. Yeah, beautiful. I have a question midwi- related with midwifery, maybe a midwife question. <laughs> When you were um, involved in, you know, midwifery obstetric um, and providing epidural to women in birth, what were you thinking <laughs> when you well, were? Honestly, as you started this question, like I can literally feel my whole body having a response to this question. Ooh. Um, Okay, I must admit at first I was terrified to learn epidurals and spinal anesthesia because it's, you know, it's scary. You, you're literally dealing with women's backs, their spine, their vertebrae. But I will never forget my first couple of epidurals, particularly independently, once I, you know, was good enough to be independent. You walk out of that room and you feel like a superstar. You feel like an absolute superstar because you've just made an immediate difference to that woman but that's the problem we walk out of that room and we don't really understand what might go on after that as a consequence of that epidural such as slowing down her labor impairing her ability to push so I never recognized that because I wasn't there until I would be called on the same shift she's failed to progress we need to convert to section And then I was like, oh, great, thank God she's got an epidural, says every anaesthetist who gets called for an emergency section. Because it's like, good, we can top up the epidural, hopefully, because it's not an ideal solution for a cesarean section. A spinal is a better anaesthetic. But for me, I started resenting epidurals because the energy around it was the woman was in victim mode the minute I walked in the door. I was like not the hero, I was the last resource and usually something that she had not wanted to do, that she had decided in her birth plan that she wanted a natural delivery, that she didn't want intervention. So to walk into a space where the midwife is disappointed that you're there, usually the woman is disappointed that you're there, the partner is probably too delirious to care and just wants it all over by now, I just felt disempowered in in participating in that in that system that being said when we were really needed I was so grateful for the skills that I had in order to relieve that suffering and pain when it was needed but I feel now reflecting back that I used to more get a sense of is this really necessary? And I think when I was in Fiji, I worked in Fiji for three months and they had no epidural service. And I was like, woohoo, I don't want to do epidurals anyway. And it was so beautiful because we hardly got called for anything. There weren't that many sections in Fiji because in Suva, they also weren't doing epidurals. And, you know, I started going, I couldn't believe they didn't have an epidural service. I actually didn't think a hospital could deliver babies without one. 
And then I saw it just working in the background. The anesthetist were rarely called for cesareans for anything. And I started, you know, thinking, wow, I don't know if all these epidurals are really that great. So, yeah, I was just more than anything relieved to not be doing them anymore. The, the short gain of going, yes, I'm a big hero and this woman is now pain-free and she wants to name her baby after me, that ended for me very quickly. I guess I don't have a very solid ego, so those sorts of things don't tend to sort of stick. I start seeing the human behind it all and just going, I'm not sure about this. Something was off. And now I think back to the midwives and so many of them, you know, I, I think a lot of it is frustration with them going into an incredibly powerful tradition yeah, and then becoming disempowered, having to tick boxes in a medical model and deliver babies that way. And I, I think reflecting back, I see that a lot of midwives probably deeply feel that even if they're not actually necessarily conscious of it. Yeah. In the doing now in the hospitals. Yeah. First, first of all, I'm amazed to hear this because you know, when I talk with anesthetists and I remember they were coming to the room, I don't have big um, experience with epidurals because I worked many years in Africa. It doesn't exist in Africa. Um, And I have experience in the UK when I was um, doing my rotation in a birthing room. And uh, when the anesthetist was coming, it was like, oh, epidurals are great. She was, <laughs> he or she was telling to the woman. And me, I was like, uh, I was like in the, like completely frozen because I, like, we know what, you know, as you were saying, that traditional, authentic midwifery, most of the time you don't need it. I am, I can understand when you have um, syntosin on, so oxytocin yes. or induction because the labor is more painful. Totally. Uh, the contractions are more painful. They're not yes. your hormones. Uh, exactly. So I can understand that. I think there is a role on, on op- epidural in that. But if you step back, is, is that induction really necessary act- or not? Like why exactly. are we using women? So, And that's a really good point that you raise because I think a lot of women might not recognise that, that they are literally part of a cascade of intervention because if you're not fitting a time model in the hospital system, that's when they go, oh, let's get let's get Sinto started. Let's yeah. start some Sinto. And women don't recognise that that is going to be a completely artificial hormone that's going to drive their labour way stronger than their body will naturally do that because yeah. the body will pace itself appropriately. Our bodies are incredibly intelligent. You override that with pharmacology, there's a consequence to that. That's more pain. That's epidural. So this is the issue is that once you say yes to one thing, then often all the other things are going to follow on because they become natural consequences of this cascade. And we know now that there are consequences actually for the mothers and the baby. Um, For example, epidural, with epidural after birth, there is more, uh, it's more challenging to latch the baby on the breast uh, because of these hormones you kind of you know nullify the hormones of the mothers uh, because yes. actually with induction with epidural with uh, other chemical substances, you actually interfere so yes. and we and we don't know in in the future we kind of know there are now many studies that says that how you birth uh, uh, impacts on your life the woman's life and the baby's life yeah and so i i really I, I don't know like i for me it feels scary that your body you know can change if you and your body but also your baby's development life can actually be impacted by all but how you what you choose for your birth your your um synthetic hormones that you put in your body it's like a little bit uh like pills and I'm, I'm not against totally against but it's the same thing contraceptive you add hormones to your body your body knows how what to do 
and actually <laughs> there are consequences uh, side effects so okay. and i i always ask myself what's going to happen in 10 15 years uh, inside my body if i if I accept to uh, take hormones or, you know, uh, whatever I do in during birth. So I always think about that and they feel scary to me, honestly. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of the time those questions aren't asked or considered. We're thinking about, well, I need this right now. We're not considering, well, how is this going to impact? Am I going to smell different to my baby when my baby comes out because I've got all of these chemicals mm. now in my body? Um, there's there's so many potential issues and we look at trying to make birthing safer. And I really believe that the degree of intervention in what is an incredibly natural process that we have been doing since we have been walking this planet is only going to cause more and more problems because the levels of intervention are now actually not providing additional benefit. The morbidity and mortality of women birthing in America is one of the worst on the planet. I was shocked when I learned this yeah. relatively recently because you're like, well, you know, they have a lot of hospitalized birth. That's the safest, right? It's tipping now. We've gone yeah. too far. And we now actually have midwives and doctors who are unskilled. All they're skilled in is cesarean section because there's not enough natural, normal yeah. delivery that doctors are seeing, that midwives are experiencing for us to actually maintain that skill level. So we get scared. We get uncomfortable. It's like, oh, we need to put her in a box as quickly as possible. This is the timeline, syntocin on epidural. Hopefully she'll deliver maybe cesarean section or even worse, scheduled cesarean section. Yeah, elective, yeah. And it's disappointing for my profession because I think midwives are the ones that, it's not midwives, but kind of represent that ancient wisdom yeah. of, you know, connecting with the, with the body, knowing inner knowing, inner wisdom. And now we've become nurses, basically. And yes. not just to say the nurses is bad or wrong. I love nurses, but it's just uh, to say that it's kind of a checklist. And actually, this is not midwifery. Midwifery is be with the women and yes. and accompanying them in, in their choices, not choosing for them, but not, you know, manipulating or doing yes. you know, all this, uh, I told you, blah, 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 uh, but actually be with them. Yes. Um, I think something that I'd like to say as well that's just come up with what you're saying is when you mentioned the nurses and midwives thing, it's just come back to my mind because really the complexity of the mothers was starting to get ridiculous in the hospital system. We've started to, with the technology that's available, we are now allowing bodies that probably wouldn't naturally fall pregnant to carry a pregnancy and birth and maybe do that over and over. So the complexity of the mother's physiology, the sometimes poor state of the mother's physiology because she's not been healthy, coming into the system is then skewing how the system responds to all women yeah. because we are seeing these high risk people in, in far too many numbers that are needing more and more interventions. And it's kind of driving that fear cycle. You know, I'm, I'm thinking back to my, you know, last years of doing obstetric work, we were dealing with, you know, so much more, more, more um, morbid obesity, so much more. Those mothers are complex in yeah. labour, in delivery. We know that they are going to have more problems. But, you know, we're not actually seeing healthy women anymore as much as we used to. And I think that's the other challenge on the system is that it's artificially creating this push to intervention because there is a growing number of women that may need it, but then that is disservicing healthy, fit women who were then pulled in that system and shoved into that same model, which they don't need. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you think that is because um, first we don't do anything before pregnancy? And at least for me, but also because 
there is like the system doesn't really uh, offer an holistic care yeah. like it's very compartment how you say compartmentalized compart something <laughs> lies compartmentalized lies. yeah exactly <laughs> And we just see section of our body, but we don't. Yes, exactly, all. exactly. I think it comes back to that earlier question that you that you drew on around responsibility, and that you know you can't just get away with suddenly giving a shit about your body when it's carrying a baby. It needs to start earlier than that. And I think you know we we don't have these conversations with people where mm. where we're not having these conversations with people. I remember in Australia, it, it was ridiculous about a, I think it was in 2019 sometime, we were told as doctors that we were no longer allowed to use the term obese because it was hurting people's feelings. And I'm like, but it's a medical diagnosis. Like this is a medical term. And so we're kind of at this point where we're almost tiptoeing around people, but then people need to take that ownership of their own health and wellness. And it, I really do believe it needs to start before you're having your baby yeah. or at, at worst, it needs to start the moment that you recognize that you're pregnant and you need to do your work and you need to yeah. do it consistently and solidly or that, you know, the system is there for you, but what a shame that you have to go there because it's a shame for you. It's a shame for your baby, but you know, it doesn't need to be that way. If you are really in commune with your body and really treating it like this incredible, valuable vessel that it is day in and day out, nourishing it, respecting it, giving it rest, giving it pleasure, giving it variety. What do you think mm. it's going to do for you when yeah. you really need it? And also, maybe here we open a big another big chapter, but what my mentor and teacher, Gabor Mate, always says is that trauma stress create inflammation in our bodies and Please. it create break our bodies and create diseases so i'm thinking also you know our families the history of the story of our family the story of the women of our lineage and how the trauma is passed on other women other people yeah. and um and the fact that, you know, obesity, uh, hypertension uh, and some other disease, many other diseases are linked actually to trauma, stress. Uh, exactly. And and I, th I think even consider that and it's something that made, uh, uh, at least for me, my experience is something that the medical system doesn't take into account and that not many people know about it um we think that our body there is something wrong in our bodies so that's why we get sick uh that our body you know can damage easily but actually you know if you look uh an analytic way considering also yes. psychologically emotionally we, we uh, first of all, we can heal that, but also just to say that um, all these long term disease and chronic disease, um, they can also come from trauma and uh, story Absolutely. of your family and and Absolutely. to look at to have the courage and the curiosity to look at them before, you know, going into pregnancy, for example, and that that becomes pathological and then you yeah. need to have intervention blah, blah blah and just yeah step back and consider that and integrate that in the medical system I think it's something that we don't do and it's yeah because you know this is getting recognized though at multiple levels you know at the scientific level it's epigenetics yeah you know, we if you look at the genes, we're 99.9% .9 the same as a chimpanzee. So it's like, well, wait a minute, what are we missing here? There's something missing. So then we've grown that knowledge and epigenetics is vital to how we actually approach individual healthcare now. You have control over which genes switch off and on. You can sit there with your victim story of, oh, my family has all cancer all the way through, we all get diabetes. Do, you don't have to propagate yeah. that ongoing. You have the capacity to turn those genes off and on by the choices that you make every single day. And you may be 
more prone. So therefore you have to be really, really careful. Someone else might be a little bit more genetically blessed. They can play around a little bit more, but that's the only real difference. And then energetically, you're absolutely right. Samskaras are like the energetic traumas that we're carrying and they can be generational. Absolutely. This is from yoga philosophy. So we need to heal all these aspects and take it from multiple layers. It's not just one thing, but that's great news because that's really empowering for people because it means that not one story is correct. You can approach this from so many different levels and take your own health and wellness into your own hands and really approach it in an individual way. Heal your family traumas. Go back through what you may be carrying. You know, mitochondrial DNA, it's inherited from our mother. What's the mitochondria in the human body? It's our energy systems, literally our little energy cells. They, we only get those from our mother. What are we carrying through that maternal line? You know, there's so much that we don't fully understand, but there's so many clues that we can start to follow those little threads and really connect with that wisdom and the different knowledge that's out there. And that's what we have available to us now in the world is so many different ways of connecting with this information for our own journey and making it really individual for us. And it doesn't have to be that that's your story for the rest of your life, that you have diabetes, you have hypertension, it doesn't or that you that. are diabetes or you are depressed yes. you are you are yes. not yes <laughs> this system is designed to yeah. be healthy it works very hard for homeostasis so a lot of those consequences are your body trying to get you back to balance so you have to get to that yeah. underlying cause they're just the body flying off problems saying hey we've got an issue here we are out of balance address it Mm, I love this conversation. <laughs> Is there anything else that we could, I think we could go on and on and on and on, but there is anything else that you want to share before closing? I don't think so. I've got to trust that this is perfect. Like, I think, you know, maybe later I'll be just like, Oh, but we can do part two. Uh, yeah. Sarah. We can do part two. Yeah. This has been so good. <laughs> yes, for me too. Uh, I love this conversation and I think they're so, so important for everyone. Thank oh, you yeah. for being uh, for for being here with me. And oh, I, so I can't wait for part two. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get it scheduled. Yes. We'll, we'll, do it, we'll do it close to a full moon again because I think that's been the other fun thing is that we've been connecting so close to this super full moon. Yes. Very, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huh?